Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter six. The next day commenced as before, getting up and dressing by rushlight. But this morning we were obliged to dispense with the ceremony of washing. The water in the pitchers was frozen. A change had taken place in the weather the preceding evening, and a keen northeast wind, whistling through the crevices of our bedroom windows all night long, had made us shiver in our beds, and turned the contents of the ewers to ice. Before the long hour and a half of prayers and Bible reading was over, I felt ready to perish with cold. Breakfast time came at last, and this morning the porridge was not burnt. The quality was eatable, the quantity small. How small my portion seemed! I wished it had been doubled. In the course of the day I was enrolled a member of the fourth class, and regular tasks and occupations were assigned me. Hitherto I had only been a spectator of the proceedings at Lowood. I was now to become an actor therein. At first, being little accustomed to learn by heart, the lessons appeared to me both long and difficult. The frequent change from task to task, too, bewildered me and I was glad when about three o'clock in the afternoon, Miss Smith put into my hands a border of muslin two yards long, together with needle, thimble, etc., and sent me to sit in a quiet corner of the schoolroom, with directions to hem the same. At that hour most of the others were sewing likewise. But one class still stood round Miss Scatcherd's chair reading, and as all was quiet, the subject of their lessons could be heard together with the manner in which each girl acquitted herself, and the animadversions or commendations of Miss Scatcherd on the performance. It was English history. Among the readers I observed my acquaintance of the veranda. At the commencement of the lesson, her place had been at the top of the class. But for some error of pronunciation, or some inattention to stops, she was suddenly sent to the very bottom. Even in that obscure position, Miss Scatcherd continued to make her an object of constant notice. She was continually addressing to her such phrases as the following. Burns! Such, it seems, was her name. The girls here were all called by their surnames, as boys are elsewhere. Burns, you are standing on the side of your shoe. Turn your toes out immediately. Burns, you poke your chin most unpleasantly. Draw it in. Burns, I insist on your holding your head up. I will not have you before me in that attitude. Etc., etc. A chapter having been read through twice, the books were closed and the girls examined. The lesson had comprised part of the reign of Charles I, and there were sundry questions about tonnage and poundage and ship-money, which most of them appeared unable to answer. Still every little difficulty was solved instantly when it reached Burns. Her memory seemed to have retained the substance of the whole lesson, and she was ready with answers on every point. I kept expecting that Miss Scatcherd would praise her attention, but instead of that she suddenly cried out, "'You dirty, disagreeable girl! You have never cleaned your nails this morning!' Burns made no answer. I wondered at her silence. Why, thought I, does she not explain that she could neither clean her nails nor wash her face as the water was frozen? My attention was now called off by Miss Smith, desiring me to hold a skein of thread while she was winding it. She talked to me from time to time, asking whether I had ever been at school before, whether I could mark, stitch, knit, etc. Till she dismissed me, I could not pursue my observations on Miss Scatcherd's movements. When I returned to my seat, that lady was just delivering an order of which I did not catch the import. But Burns immediately left the class and going into the small inner room where the books were kept, returned in half a minute, carrying in her hand a bundle of twigs tied together at one end. This ominous tool she presented to Miss Scatcherd with a respectful curtsey. Then she quietly, and without being told, unloosed her pinafore, and the teacher instantly and sharply inflicted on her neck a dozen strokes with a bunch of twigs. Not a tear rose to Burns's eye, and while I paused from my sewing, because my fingers quivered at this spectacle with a sentiment of unavailing and impotent anger, not a feature of her pensive face altered its ordinary expression. "'Hardened girl!' exclaimed Miss Scatcherd. "'Nothing can correct you of your slatternly habits. Carry the rod away!' Burns obeyed. I looked at her narrowly as she emerged from the book-closet. She was just putting back her handkerchief into her pocket and the trace of a tear glistened on her thin cheek. The play-hour in the evening I thought the pleasantest fraction of the day at Lowood, the bit of bread, 
The draught of coffee swallowed at five o'clock had revived vitality, if it had not satisfied hunger. The long restraint of the day was slackened. The schoolroom felt warmer than in the morning, its fires being allowed to burn a little more brightly, to supply, in some measure, the place of candles not yet introduced. The ruddy gloaming, the licensed uproar, the confusion of many voices gave one a welcome sense of liberty. On the evening of the day on which I had seen Miss Scatcherd flog her pupil, Burns, I wandered as usual among the forms and tables and laughing groups without a companion, yet not feeling lonely. When I passed the windows, I now and then lifted a blind and looked out. It snowed fast. A drift was already forming against the lower panes. Putting my ear close to the window, I could distinguish from the gleeful tumult within, the disconsolate moan of the wind outside. Probably, if I had lately left a good home and kind parents, this would have been the hour when I should have most keenly regretted the separation. That wind would then have saddened my heart. This obscure chaos would have disturbed my peace. As it was, I derived from both a strange excitement, and reckless and feverish I wished the wind to howl more wildly, the gloom to deepen to darkness, and the confusion to rise to clamour. Jumping over forms and creeping under tables, I made my way to one of the fireplaces. There, kneeling by the high wire fender, I found Burns, absorbed, silent, abstracted from all round her by the companionship of a book, which she read by the dim glare of the embers. "'Is it still Rasselas? I asked, coming behind her. "'Yes,' she said, "'and I have just finished it.' And in five minutes more she shut it up. I was glad of this. Now, thought I, I can perhaps get her to talk. I sat down by her on the floor. "'What is your name besides Burns?' "'Helen. Do you come a long way from here?' "'I come from a place farther north, quite on the borders of Scotland.' "'Will you ever go back?' "'I hope so. But nobody can be sure of the future.' "'You must wish to leave Lowood.' "'No. Why should I? I was sent to Lowood to get an education, and it would be of no use going away until I have attained that object. But that teacher, Miss Scatcherd, is so cruel to you." Cruel? Not at all. She is severe. She dislikes my faults. And if I were in your place, I should dislike her. I should resist her. If she struck me with that rod, I should get it from her hand. I should break it under her nose. And probably you do nothing of the sort. But if you did, Mr. Brocklehurst would expel you from the school. That would be a great grief to your relations. It is far better to endure patiently a smart which nobody feels but yourself, than to commit a hasty action whose evil consequences will extend to all connected with you. And besides, the Bible bids us return good for evil. But then it seems disgraceful to be flogged, and to be sent to stand in the middle of a room full of people. And you are such a great girl! I am far younger than you, and I could not bear it. Yes, it would be your duty to bear it, if you could not avoid it. It is weak and silly to say you cannot bear what it is your fate to be required to bear." I heard her with wonder. I could not comprehend this doctrine of endurance, and still less could I understand or sympathise with the forbearance she expressed for her chastiser. Still I felt that Helen Burns considered things by a light invisible to my eyes. I suspected she might be right and I wrong, but I would not ponder the matter deeply. Like Felix, I put it off to a more convenient season. "'You say you have faults, Helen. What are they? To me you seem very good.' "'Then learn from me not to judge by appearances. I am, as Miss Scatcherd said, slatternly. I seldom put and never keep things in order. I am careless. I forget rules. I read when I should learn my lessons. I have no method. And I sometimes say, like you, I cannot bear to be subjected to systematic arrangements. This is all very provoking to Miss Scatcherd, who is naturally neat, punctual, and particular." "'And cross, and cruel,' I added. But Helen Burns would not admit my addition. She kept silence. "'Is Miss Temple as severe to you as Miss Scatcherd?' At the utterance of Miss Temple's name a soft smile flitted over her grave face. Miss Temple is full of goodness. It pains her to be severe to any one, even the worst in the school. She sees my errors, and tells me of them gently, 
and if I do anything worthy of praise, she gives me my meed liberally. One strong proof of my wretchedly defective nature is, that even her expostulations, so mild, so rational, have not influence to cure me of my faults, and even her praise, though I value it most highly, cannot stimulate me to continued care and foresight. That is curious, said I. It is so easy to be careful. For you, I have no doubt it is. I observed you in your class this morning, and saw you were closely attentive. Your thoughts never seemed to wander while Miss Miller explained the lesson and questioned you. Now mine continually rove away. When I should be listening to Miss Scatcherd and collecting all she says with assiduity, often I lose the very sound of her voice. I fall into a sort of dream. Sometimes I think I am in Northumberland, and that the noises I hear round me are the bubbling of a little brook which runs through Deepton near our house. Then, when it comes to my turn to reply, I have to be awakened, and having heard nothing of what was read for listening to the visionary brook, I have no answer ready. Yet how well you replied this afternoon! It was mere chance. The subject on which we had been reading had interested me. This afternoon, instead of dreaming of Deepton, I was wondering how a man who wished to do right could act so unjustly and unwisely as Charles I sometimes did. And I thought what a pity it was that, with his integrity and conscientiousness, he could see no farther than the prerogatives of the crown. If he had but been able to look to a distance, and see how what they call the spirit of the age was tending! Still, I like Charles. I respect him. I pity him, poor murdered king. Yes, his enemies were the worst. They shed blood they had no right to shed. How dared they kill him! Helen was talking to herself now. She had forgotten I could not very well understand her, that I was ignorant, or nearly so, of the subject she discussed. I recalled her to my level. And when Miss Temple teaches you, do your thoughts wander then? No, certainly not often. Because Miss Temple has generally something to say which is newer than my own reflections, her language is singularly agreeable to me, and the information she communicates is often just what I wish to gain. Well, then, with Miss Temple you are good. Yes, in a passive way. I make no effort. I follow as inclination guides me. There is no merit in such goodness. A great deal. You are good to those who are good to you. It is all I ever desire to be. If people were always kind and obedient to those who are cruel and unjust, the wicked people would have it all their own way. They would never feel afraid, and so they would never alter, but would grow worse and worse. When we are struck out without a reason, we should strike back again very hard. I am sure we should, so hard as to teach the person who struck us never to do it again. You will change your mind, I hope, when you grow older. As yet you are but a little untaught girl. But I feel this, Helen. I must dislike those who, whatever I do to please them, persist in disliking me. I must resist those who punish me unjustly. It is as natural as that I should love those who show me affection, or submit to punishment when I feel it is deserved. Heathens and savage tribes hold that doctrine, but Christians and civilized nations disown it. How? I don't understand. It is not violence that best overcomes hate, nor vengeance that most certainly heals injury. What, then? Read the New Testament, and observe what Christ says, and how He acts. Make His word your rule, and His conduct your example. What does He say? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and despitefully use you. Then I should love Mrs. Reed, which I cannot do. I should bless her son John, which is impossible." In her turn, Helen Burns asked me to explain, and I proceeded forthwith to pour out in my own way the tale of my sufferings and resentments. Bitter and truculent when excited, I spoke as I felt, without reserve or softening. Helen heard me patiently to the end. I expected she would then make a remark, but she said nothing. Well, I asked impatiently, is not Mrs. Reed a hard-hearted, bad woman? She has been unkind to you, no doubt. Because you see, she dislikes your cast of character, as Miss Scatcherd does mine. But how minutely you remember all she has done and said to you! What a singularly deep impression her injustice seems to have made on your heart! 
No ill-usage so brands its record on my feelings. Would you not be happier if you tried to forget her severity, together with the passionate emotions it excited? Life appears to me too short to be sent in nursing animosity or registering wrongs. We are, and must be, one and all, burdened with faults in this world. But the time will soon come, when, I trust, we shall put them off in putting off our corruptible bodies, when debasement and sin will fall from us with this cumbrous frame of flesh, and only the spark of the spirit will remain. The impalpable principle of light and thought, pure as when it left the Creator to inspire the creature, whence it came, it will return, perhaps again to be communicated to some being higher than man, perhaps to pass through gradations of glory, from the pale human soul to brighten to the seraph. Surely it will never, on the contrary, be suffered to degenerate from man to fiend. No, I cannot believe that. I hold another creed, which no one ever taught me, and which I seldom mention, but in which I delight, and to which I cling. For it extends hope to all, it makes eternity a rest, a mighty home, not a terror and an abyss. Besides, with this creed, I can so clearly distinguish between the criminal and his crime, I can so sincerely forgive the first while I abhor the last. With this creed revenge never worries my heart, degradation never too deeply disgusts me, injustice never crushes me too low. I live in calm, looking to the end." Helen's head, always drooping, sank a little lower as she finished this sentence. I saw by her look she wished no longer to talk to me, but rather to converse with her own thoughts. She was not allowed much time for meditation. A monitor, a great, rough girl, presently came up, exclaiming in a strong Cumberland accent, "'Helen Burns, if you don't go and put your drawer in order, and fold up your work this minute, I'll tell Miss Scatterd to come and look at it!' Helen sighed as her reverie fled, and getting up, obeyed the monitor without reply as without delay. CHAPTER Seven. My first quarter at Lowood seemed an age, and not the golden age, either. It comprised an irksome struggle with difficulties in habituating myself to new rules and unwonted tasks. The fear of failure in these points harassed me worse than the physical hardships of my lot, though these were no trifles. During January, February, and part of March, the deep snows, and after their melting, the almost impassable roads, prevented our stirring beyond the garden walls, except to go to church. But within these limits we had to pass an hour every day in the open air. Our clothing was insufficient to protect us from the severe cold. We had no boots, the snow got into our shoes and melted there. Our ungloved hands became numbed and covered with chilblains, as were our feet. I remember well the distracting irritation I endured from this cause every evening, when my feet inflamed, and the torture of thrusting the swelled, raw, and stiff toes into my shoes in the morning. Then the scanty supply of food was distressing. With the keen appetites of growing children, we had scarcely sufficient to keep alive a delicate invalid. From this deficiency of nourishment resulted an abuse, which pressed hardly on the younger pupils. Whenever the famished great girls had an opportunity, they would coax or menace the little ones out of their portion. Many a time I have shared between two claimants the precious morsel of brown bread distributed at tea-time, and after relinquishing to a third half the contents of my mug of coffee, I have swallowed the remainder with an accompaniment of secret tears, forced from me by the exigency of hunger. Sundays were dreary days in that wintry season. We had to walk two miles to Brocklebridge Church, where our patron officiated. We set out cold, we arrived at church colder, during the morning service we became almost paralysed. It was too far to return to dinner, and an allowance of cold meat and bread, in the same penurious proportion observed in our ordinary meals, was served round between the services. At the close of the afternoon service we returned by an exposed and hilly road, where the bitter winter wind, blowing over a range of snowy summits to the north, almost flayed the skin from our faces. 
I can remember Miss Temple walking lightly and rapidly along our drooping line, her plaid cloak, which the frosty wind fluttered, gathered close about her, and encouraging us by precept and example to keep up our spirits and march forward, as she said, like stalwart soldiers. The other teachers, poor things, were generally themselves too much dejected to attempt the task of cheering others. How we longed for the light and heat of a blazing fire when we got back! But to the little ones at least this was denied. Each hearth in the schoolroom was immediately surrounded by a double row of great girls, and behind them the younger children crouched in groups, wrapping their starved arms in their pinafores. A little solace came at tea-time in the shape of a double ration of bread, a whole instead of a half slice, with the delicious addition of a thin scrape of butter. It was the hebdomadal treat to which we all looked forward from Sabbath to Sabbath. I generally contrived to reserve a moiety of this bounteous repast for myself, but the remainder I was invariably obliged to part with. The Sunday evening was spent in repeating by heart the church catechism, and the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters of St. Matthew, and in listening to a long sermon read by Miss Miller, whose irrepressible yawns attested her weariness. A frequent interlude of these performances was the enactment of the part of Eutychus by some half-dozen of little girls, who, overpowered with sleep, would fall down, if not out of the third loft, yet off the fourth form, and be taken up half-dead. The remedy was to thrust them forward into the centre of the schoolroom, and oblige them to stand there till the sermon was finished. Sometimes their feet failed them, and they sank together in a heap. They were then propped up with the monitor's high stools. I have not yet alluded to the visits of Mr. Brocklehurst, and indeed that gentleman was from home during the great part of the first month after my arrival, perhaps prolonging his stay with his friend the archdeacon. His absence was a relief to me. I need not say that I had my own reasons for dreading his coming. But come he did at last. One afternoon, I had then been three weeks at Lowood, as I was sitting with a slate in my hand, puzzling over a sum in long division, my eyes, raised in abstraction to the window, caught sight of a figure just passing. I recognised almost instinctively that gaunt outline. And when, two minutes after, all the school, teachers included, rose en masse, it was not necessary for me to look up in order to ascertain whose entrance they thus greeted. A long stride measured the schoolroom, and presently beside Miss Temple, who had herself risen, stood the same black column which had frowned on me so ominously from the hearthrug of Gateshead. I now glanced sideways at this piece of architecture. Yes, I was right. It was Mr. Brocklehurst, buttoned up in a surtout, and looking longer, narrower, and more rigid than ever. I had my own reasons for being dismayed at this apparition. Too well I remembered the perfidious hints given by Mrs. Reed about my disposition, etc. The promise pledged by Mr. Brocklehurst to apprise Miss Temple and the teachers of my vicious nature. All along I had been dreading the fulfilment of this promise. I had been looking out daily for the coming man, whose information respecting my past life and conversation was to brand me as a bad child for ever. Now there he was. He stood at Miss Temple's side. He was speaking low in her ear. I did not doubt he was making disclosures of my villainy, and I watched her eye with painful anxiety, expecting every moment to see its dark orb turn on me a glance of repugnance and contempt. I listened, too, and as I happened to be seated quite at the top of the room, I caught most of what he said. Its import relieved me from immediate apprehension. "'I suppose, Miss Temple, the thread I bought at Lowton will do. It struck me that it would be just of the quality for the calico chemises, and I sorted the needles to match. You may tell Miss Smith that I forgot to make a memorandum of the darning needles, but she shall have some papers sent in next week and she is not, on any account, to give out more than one at a time to each pupil. If they have more, they are apt to be careless, and lose them. And, oh, ma'am, I wish the woollen stockings were better looked to. When I was here last, I went into the kitchen garden and examined the clothes drying on the line. There was a quantity of black hose in a very bad state of repair. From the size of the holes in them, I was sure they had not been well mended from time to time." He paused. 
"'Your directions shall be attended to, sir,' said Miss Temple. "'And, ma'am,' he continued, "'the laundress tells me some of the girls have two clean tuckers in the week. It is too much. The rules limit them to one.' "'I think I can explain that circumstance, sir. Agnes and Catherine Johnston were invited to take tea with some friends at Lowton last Thursday, and I gave them leave to put on clean tuckers for the occasion.' Mr. Brocklehurst nodded. "'Well, for once it may pass. But please not to let the circumstance occur too often. And there is another thing which surprised me. I find, in settling accounts with the housekeeper, that a lunch, consisting of bread and cheese, has twice been served out to the girls during the past fortnight. How is this? I looked over the regulations, and I find no such meal as lunch mentioned. Who introduced this innovation? And by what authority?" "'I must be responsible for the circumstance, sir,' replied Miss Temple. The breakfast was so ill-prepared that the pupils could not possibly eat it, and I dared not allow them to remain fasting till dinner-time. "'Madam, allow me an instant. You are aware that my plan in bringing up these girls is not to accustom them to habits of luxury and indulgence, but to render them hardy, patient, self-denying. Should any little accidental disappointment of the appetite occur, such as the spoiling of a meal, the under or the over-dressing of a dish, the incident ought not to be neutralised by replacing with something more delicate the comfort lost, thus pampering the body, and obviating the aim of this institution. It ought to be improved to the spiritual edification of the pupils, by encouraging them to evince fortitude under temporary privation. A brief address on those occasions would not be mistimed, wherein a judicious instructor would take the opportunity of referring to the sufferings of the primitive Christians, to the torments of martyrs, to the exhortations of our blessed Lord Himself, calling upon His disciples to take up their cross and follow Him, to His warnings that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, to His divine consolations. If ye suffer hunger or thirst for my sake, happy are ye. O oh, madam, when you put bread and cheese instead of burnt porridge into these children's mouths, you may indeed feed their vile bodies, but you little think how you starve their immortal souls." Mr. Brocklehurst again paused, perhaps overcome by his feelings. Miss Temple had looked down when he first began to speak to her. But she now gazed straight before her, and her face, naturally pale as marble, appeared to be assuming also the coldness and fixity of that material, especially her mouth, closed as if it would have required a sculptor's chisel to open it, and her brow settled gradually into petrified severity. Meantime Mr. Brocklehurst, standing on the hearth with his hands behind his back, majestically surveyed the whole school. Suddenly his eye gave a blink, as if it had met something that either dazzled or shocked its pupil. Turning, he said in more rapid accents than he had hitherto used, "'Miss Temple! Miss Temple! What! what is that girl with curled hair? Red hair, ma'am! Curled! Curled all over!' And extending his cane, he pointed to the awful object, his hand shaking as he did so. "'It is Julia Seven replied Miss Temple very quietly. "'Julia Seven, ma'am! And why has she or any other curled hair? Why, in defiance of every precept and principle of this house, does she conform to the world so openly, here, in an evangelical charitable establishment, as to wear her hair one mass of curls?' "'Julia's hair curls naturally,' returned Miss Temple, still more quietly. "'Naturally?' Yes, but we are not to conform to nature. I wish these girls to be the children of grace. And why that abundance? I have again and again intimated that I desire the hair to be arranged closely, modestly, plainly. Miss Temple, that girl's hair must be cut off entirely. I will send a barber to-morrow. And I see others who have far too much of the excrescence. That tall girl, tell her to turn round. Tell all the first form to rise up and direct their faces to the wall." Miss Temple passed her handkerchief over her lips, as if to smooth away the involuntary smile that curled them. 
She gave the order, however, and when the first class could take in what was required of them, they obeyed. Leaning a little back on my bench, I could see the looks and grimaces with which they commented on this manoeuvre. It was a pity Mr. Brocklehurst could not see them too. He would perhaps have felt that, whatever he might do with the outside of the cup and platter, the inside was further beyond his interference than he imagined. He scrutinised the reverse of these living medals some five minutes, then pronounced sentence. These words fell like the knell of doom. "'All those top-knots must be cut off!' Miss Temple seemed to remonstrate. "'Madam,' he pursued, "'I have a master to serve whose kingdom is not of this world. My mission is to mortify in these girls the lusts of the flesh, to teach them to clothe themselves with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair and costly apparel. And each of the young persons before us has a string of hair twisted in plates, which vanity itself might have woven. These, I repeat, must be cut off. Think of the time wasted of— Mr. Brocklehurst was here interrupted. Three other visitors, ladies, now entered the room. They ought to have come a little sooner to have heard his lecture on dress, for they were splendidly attired in velvet, silk, and furs. The two younger of the trio, fine girls of sixteen and seventeen, had grey beaver hats, then in fashion, shaded with ostrich plumes, and from under the brim of this graceful head-dress fell a profusion of light tresses, elaborately curled. The elder lady was enveloped in a costly velvet shawl, trimmed with ermine, and she wore a false front of French curls. These ladies were deferentially received by Miss Temple, as Mrs. and the Misses Brocklehurst, and conducted to seats of honour at the top of the room. It seems they had come in the carriage with their reverend relative, and had been conducting a rummaging scrutiny of the rooms upstairs, while he transacted business with the housekeeper, questioned the laundress, and lectured the superintendent. They now proceeded to address divers remarks and reproofs to Miss Smith, who was charged with the care of the linen and inspection of the dormitories. But I had no time to listen to what they said. Other matters called off and enchanted my attention. Hitherto, while gathering up the discourse of Mr. Brocklehurst and Miss Temple, I had not at the same time neglected precautions to secure my personal safety, which I thought would be effected if I could only elude observation. To this end I had sat well back on the form, and while seeming to be busy with my sum, had held my slate in such a manner as to conceal my face. I might have escaped notice had not my treacherous slate somehow happened to slip from my hand, and falling with an obtrusive crash, directly drawn every eye upon me. I knew it was all over now, and as I stooped to pick up the two fragments of slate, I rallied my forces for the worst. It came. "'A careless girl!' said Mr. Brocklehurst, and immediately after, "'It is the new pupil, I perceive.' And before I could draw breath, I must not forget, I have a word to say respecting her." Then aloud, how loud it seemed to me! "'Let the child who broke her slate come forward!' Of my own accord I could not have stirred. I was paralysed. But the two great girls who sit on each side of me, set me on my legs and pushed me towards the dread judge. And then Miss Temple gently assisted me to his very feet, and I caught her whispered counsel. "'Don't be afraid, Jane. I saw it was an accident. You shall not be punished." The kind whisper went to my heart like a dagger. "'Another minute, and she will despise me for a hypocrite,' thought I. And an impulse of fury against Reed, Brocklehurst, and company bounded in my pulses at the conviction. I was no Helen Burns. "'Fetch that stool,' said Mr. Brocklehurst, pointing to a very high one from which a monitor had just risen. It was brought. Place the child upon it." And I was placed there, by whom I don't know. I was in no condition to note particulars. I was only aware that they had hoisted me up to the height of Mr. Brocklehurst's nose, that he was within a yard of me, and that a spread of shot orange and purple silk pelisses, and a cloud of silvery plumage extended and waved below me. Mr. Brocklehurst hemmed. "'Ladies,' said he, turning to his family, "'Miss Temple, teachers and children, you all see this girl." Of course they did, for I felt their eyes directed like burning glasses against my scorched skin. "'You see she is yet young. You observe she possesses the ordinary form of childhood. 
God has graciously given her the shape that He has given to all of us. No signal deformity points her out as a marked character. Who would think that the evil one had already found a servant and agent in her? Yet such, I grieve to say, is the case." A pause, in which I began to steady the palsy of my nerves, and to feel that the Rubicon was passed, and that the trial no longer to be shirked, must be firmly sustained. "'My dear children,' pursued the black marble clergyman with pathos, "'this is a sad, a melancholy occasion, for it becomes my duty to warn you, that this girl, who might be one of God's own lambs, is a little castaway, not a member of the true flock, but evidently an interloper, and an alien. You must be on your guard against her. You must shun her example. If necessary, avoid her company, exclude her from your sports, and shut her out from your converse. Teachers, you must watch her. Keep your eyes on her movements, weigh well her words, scrutinize her actions, punish her body to save her soul, if indeed such salvation be possible. For, my tongue falters while I tell it, this girl, this child, the native of a Christian land, worse than many a little heathen who says its prayers to Brahma and kneels before Juggernaut, this girl is a liar. Now came a pause of ten minutes, during which I, by this time in perfect possession of my wits, observed all the female Brocklehursts produce their pocket-handkerchiefs, and apply them to their optics, while the elderly lady swayed herself to and fro, and the two younger ones whispered, "'How shocking!' Mr. Brocklehurst resumed. "'This I learned from her benefactress from the pious and charitable lady who adopted her in her orphan state, reared her as her own daughter, and whose kindness, whose generosity the unhappy girl repaid by an ingratitude so bad, so dreadful, that at last her excellent patroness was obliged to separate her from her own young ones, fearful lest her vicious example should contaminate their purity. She has sent her here to be healed even as the Jews of old sent their disease to the troubled pool of Bethesda. And teachers, superintendent, I beg of you, not to allow the waters to stagnate round her." With this sublime conclusion, Mr. Brocklehurst adjusted the top button of his surtout, muttered something to his family, who rose, bowed to Miss Temple, and then all of the great people sailed in state from the room. Turning at the door, my judge said, "'Let her stand half an hour longer on that stool, and let no one speak to her during the remainder of the day.' There was I, then, mounted aloft. I, who had said I could not bear the shame of standing on my natural feet in the middle of the room, was now exposed to general view on a pedestal of infamy. What my sensations were, no language can describe. But just as they all rose, stifling my breath and constricting my throat, a girl came up and passed me. In passing, she lifted her eyes. What a strange light inspired them! What an extraordinary sensation that ray sent through me! How the new feeling bore me up! It was as if a martyr, a hero, had passed a slave or victim, and imparted strength in the transit. I mastered the rising hysteria, lifted up my head, and took a firm stand on the stool. Helen Burns asked some slight question about her work of Miss Smith, was chidden for the triviality of the inquiry, returned to her place, and smiled at me again as she went by. What a smile! I remember it now, and I know that it was the effluence of fine intellect, of true courage. It lit up her marked lineaments, her thin face, her sunken grey eye, like a reflection from the aspect of an angel. Yet at that moment Helen Burns wore on her arm the untidy badge. Scarcely an hour ago I had heard her condemned by Miss Scatcherd to a dinner of bread and water on the morrow, because she had blotted an exercise in copying it out. Such is the imperfect nature of man. Such spots are there on the disk of the clearest planet, and eyes like Miss Scatcherd's can only see those minute defects, and are blind to the full brightness of the orb. Chapter Eight. Ere the half-hour ended, five o'clock struck. 
School was dismissed, and all were gone into the refectory to tea. I now ventured to descend. It was deep dusk. I retired into a corner, and sat down on the floor. The spell by which I had been so far supported began to dissolve. Reaction took place, and soon so overwhelming was the grief that seized me, I sank prostrate with my face to the ground. Now I wept. Helen Burns was not here. Nothing sustained me. Left to myself, I abandoned myself, and my tears watered the boards. I had meant to be so good, and to do so much at Lowood, to make so many friends, to earn respect, and win affection. Already I had made visible progress. That very morning I had reached the head of my class. Miss Miller had praised me warmly, Miss Temple had smiled approbation. She had promised to teach me drawing, and to let me learn French, if I continued to make similar improvement two months longer. And then I was well received by my fellow pupils, treated as an equal by those of my own age, and not molested by any. Now, here I lay again, crushed and trodden on, and could I ever rise more? Never, I thought, and ardently I wished to die. While sobbing out this wish in broken accents, some one approached. I started up. Again Helen Burns was near me. The fading fires just showed her coming up the long, vacant room. She brought my coffee and bread. "'Come, eat something,' she said. But I put both away from me, feeling as if a drop or a crumb would have choked me in my present condition. Helen regarded me, probably with surprise. I could not now abate my agitation, though I tried hard. I continued to weep aloud. She sat down on the ground near me, embraced her knees with her arms, and rested her head upon them. In that attitude she remained silent as an Indian. I was the first who spoke. "'Helen, why do you stay with a girl whom everybody believes to be a liar?' "'Everybody, Jane?' Why, there are only eighty people who have heard you called so, and the world contains hundreds of millions. But what have I to do with millions? The eighty I know despise me. Jane, you are mistaken. Probably not one in the school either despises or dislikes you. Many, I am sure, pity you much. How can they pity me after what Mr. Brocklehurst has said? Mr. Brocklehurst is not a god nor is he even a great and admired man. He is little liked here. He never took steps to make himself liked. Had he treated you as an especial favourite, you would have found enemies, declared or covert, all round you. As it is, the greater number would offer you sympathy if they dared. Teachers and pupils may look coldly on you for a day or two, but friendly feelings are concealed in their hearts, and if you persevere in doing well, these feelings will ere long appear so much the more evidently for their temporary suppression. Besides, Jane, she paused. Well, Helen, said I, putting my hand into hers. She chafed my fingers gently to warm them, and went on. If all the world hated you, and believed you wicked, while your own conscience approved you, and absolved you from guilt, you would not be without friends. No. I know I should think well of myself, but that is not enough. If others don't love me, I would rather die than live. I cannot bear to be solitary and hated, Helen. Look here, to gain some real affection from you, or Miss Temple, or any other whom I truly love, I would willingly submit to have the bone of my arm broken, or to let a bull toss me, or to stand behind a kicking horse, and let it dash its hoof at my chest. Hush, Jane! You think too much of the love of human beings. You are too impulsive, too vehement. The sovereign hand that created your frame and put life into it, has provided you with other resources than your feeble self, or than creatures feeble as you. Besides this earth, and besides the race of men, there is an invisible world and a kingdom of spirits. That world is round us, for it is everywhere. And those spirits watch us, for they are commissioned to guard us. And if we were dying in pain and shame, if scorn smote us on all sides, and hatred crushed us, angels see our tortures, recognise our innocence. If innocent we be, 
as I know you are of this charge, which Mr. Brocklehurst has weakly and pompously repeated at second hand from Mrs. Reed, for I read a sincere nature in your ardent eyes and on your clear front. And God waits only the separation of spirit from flesh to crown us with a full reward. Why, then, should we ever sink overwhelmed with distress, when life is so soon over, and death is so certain an entrance to happiness, to glory? I was silent. Helen had calmed me. But in the tranquillity she imparted there was an alloy of inexpressible sadness. I felt the impression of woe as she spoke, but I could not tell whence it came. And when, having done speaking, she breathed a little fast, and coughed a short cough, I momentarily forgot my own sorrows to yield to a vague concern for her. Resting my head on Helen's shoulder, I put my arms round her waist. She drew me to her, and we reposed in silence. We had not sat long thus, when another person came in. Some heavy clouds, swept from the sky by a rising wind, had left the moon bare and her light, streaming in through a window near, shone full both on us and on the approaching figure, which we at once recognised as Miss Temple. "'I came on purpose to find you, Jane Eyre,' said she. "'I want you in my room, and as Helen Burns is with you, she may come too.' We went, following the superintendent's guidance. We had to thread some intricate passages, and mount a staircase before we reached her apartment. It contained a good fire, and looked cheerful. Miss Temple told Helen Burns to be seated in a low armchair on one side of the hearth, and herself taking another, she called me to her side. "'Is it all over?' she asked, looking down at my face. "'Have you cried your grief away?' "'I'm afraid I never shall do that.' "'Why?' "'Because I have been wrongly accused, and you, Mum, and everybody else, will now think me wicked.' We shall think you what you prove yourself to be, my child. Continue to act as a good girl, and you will satisfy us." "'Shall I, Miss Temple?' "'You will,' said she, passing her arm round me. "'And now, tell me, who was the lady whom Mr. Brocklehurst called your benefactress?' "'Mrs. Reed, my uncle's wife. My uncle is dead, and he left me to her care. Did she not then adopt you of her own accord?' No, mum. She was sorry to have to do it, but my uncle, as I have often heard the servants say, got it a promise before he died that she would always keep me. Well, now, Jane, you know, or at least I will tell you, that when a criminal is accused he is always allowed to speak in his own defence. You have been charged with falsehood. Defend yourself to me as well as you can. Say whatever your memory suggests is true, but add nothing, and exaggerate nothing. I resolved, in the depth of my heart, that I would be most moderate, most correct, and having a few minutes in order to arrange coherently what I had to say, I told her all the story of my sad childhood. Exhausted by emotion, my language was more subdued than it generally was when it developed that sad theme, and mindful of Helen's warnings against the indulgence of resentment, I infused into the narrative far less of gall and wormwood than ordinary. Thus restrained and simplified, it sounded more credible. I felt as I went on that Miss Temple fully believed me. In the course of the tale I had mentioned Mr. Lloyd as having come to see me after the fit. I never forgot the, to me, frightful episode of the Red Room, in detailing which my excitement was sure in some degree to break bounds, for nothing could soften in my reflection the spasm of agony which clutched my heart, when Mrs. Reed spurned my wild supplication for pardon, and locked me a second time in the dark and haunted chamber. I had finished. Miss Temple regarded me a few minutes in silence. She then said, "'I know something of Mr. Lloyd. I shall write to him. If his reply agrees with your statement, you shall be publicly cleared from every imputation. To me, Jane, you are clear now." She kissed me, and still keeping me at her side, where I was well contented to stand, for I derived a child's pleasure from the contemplation of her face, her dress, her one or two ornaments, her white forehead, her clustered and shining curls and beaming dark eyes. She proceeded to address Helen Burns. "'How are you to-night, Helen? Have you coughed much to-day?" "'Not quite so much, I think, ma'am." and the pain in your chest?" 
It is a little better." Miss Temple got up, took her hand and examined her pulse. Then she returned to her own seat. As she resumed it, I heard her sigh low. She was pensive a few minutes. Then rousing herself, she said cheerfully, "'But you two are my visitors to-night. I must treat you as such.' She rang her bell. "'Barbara,' she said to the servant who answered it, "'I have not yet had tea. Bring the tray, and place cups for these two young ladies.' And a tray was soon brought. How pretty, to my eyes, did the china cups and bright teapot look, placed on the little round table near the fire! How fragrant was the steam of the beverage, and the scent of the toast! Of which, however, I, to my dismay, for I was beginning to be hungry, discerned only a very small portion. Miss Temple discerned it too. "'Barbara,' said she, "'can you not bring a little more bread and butter? There is not enough for three. Barbara went out. She returned soon. "'Madam, Mrs. Arden says she has sent up the usual quantity.' Mrs. Harden, be it observed, was the housekeeper, a woman after Mr. Brocklehurst's own heart, made up of equal parts of whalebone and iron. "'Oh, very well,' returned Miss Temple. "'We must make it do, Barbara, I suppose.' As the girl withdrew, she added, smiling, "'Fortunately, I have it in my power to supply deficiencies for this once.' Having invited Helen and me to approach the table, and placed before each of us a cup of tea with one delicious but thin morsel of toast, she got up, unlocked a drawer, and taking from it a parcel wrapped in paper, disclosed presently to our eyes a good-sized seed-cake. "'I meant to give each of you some of this to take with you,' said she, "'but as there is so little toast, you must have it now.' And she proceeded to cut slices with a generous hand. We feasted that evening as on nectar and ambrosia, and not the least delight of the entertainment was the smile of gratification with which our hostess regarded us, as we satisfied our famished appetites on the delicate fare she liberally supplied. Tea over, and the tray removed, she again summoned us to the fire. We sat one on each side of her, and now a conversation followed between her and Helen, which it was indeed a privilege to be admitted to hear. Miss Temple had always something of serenity in her air, of state in her mien, of refined propriety in her language, which precluded deviation into the ardent, the excited, the eager, something which chastened the pleasure of those who looked on her and listened to her, by a controlling sense of awe, and such was my feeling now. But as to Helen Burns, I was struck with wonder. The refreshing meal, the brilliant fire, the presence and kindness of her beloved instructress, or perhaps more than all these, something in her own unique mind, had roused her powers within her. They woke, they kindled. First they glowed in the bright tint of her cheek, which till this hour I had never seen but pale and bloodless. Then they shone in the liquid lustre of her eyes, which had suddenly acquired a beauty more singular than that of Miss Temple's, a beauty neither of fine colour, nor long eyelash, nor pencilled brow, but of meaning of movement, of radiance. Then her soul sat on her lips, and language flowed, from what source I cannot tell. Has a girl of fourteen a heart large enough, vigorous enough, to hold the swelling spring of pure, full, fervid eloquence? Such was the characteristic of Helen's discourse, on that, to me, memorable evening. Her spirit seemed hastening to live within a very brief span as much as many live during a protracted existence. They conversed of things I had never heard of, of nations and times past, of countries far away, of secrets of nature discovered or guessed at. They spoke of books, how many they had read, what stores of knowledge they possessed. Then they seemed so familiar with French names and French authors but my amazement reached its climax when Miss Temple asked Helen if she sometimes snatched a moment to recall the Latin her father had taught her, and taking a book from a shelf, bade her read and construe a page of Virgil. And Helen obeyed, my organ of veneration expanding at every sounding line. She had scarcely finished ere the bell announced bedtime. No delay could be admitted. Miss Temple embraced us both, saying as she drew us to her heart, God bless you, my children. 
Helen she held a little longer than me. She let her go more reluctantly. It was Helen her eye followed to the door. It was for her she a second time breathed a sad sigh. For her she wiped a tear from her cheek. On reaching the bedroom, we heard the voice of Miss Scatcherd. She was examining drawers. She had just pulled out Helen Burns, and when we entered, Helen was greeted with a sharp reprimand, and told that to-morrow she should have half a dozen of untidily folded articles pinned to her shoulder. "'My things were indeed in shameful disorder,' murmured Helen to me in a low voice. "'I intended to have arranged them, but I forgot.' Next morning Miss Scatcherd wrote in conspicuous characters on a piece of pasteboard the word SLATTEN, and bound it like a phylactery around Helen's large, mild, intelligent, and benign-looking forehead. She wore it till evening, patient, unresentful, regarding it as deserved punishment. The moment Miss Scatcherd withdrew after afternoon school, I ran to Helen, tore it off, and thrust it into the fire. The fury of which she was incapable had been burning in my soul all day, and tears, hot and large, had continually been scalding my cheek, for the spectacle of her sad resignation gave me an intolerable pain at the heart. About a week subsequently to the incidents above narrated, Miss Temple, who had written to Mr. Lloyd, received his answer. It appeared that what he said went to corroborate my account. Miss Temple, having assembled the whole school, announced that inquiry had been made into the charges alleged against Jane Eyre, and that she was most happy to be able to pronounce her completely cleared from every imputation. The teachers then shook hands with me and kissed me, and a murmur of pleasure ran through the ranks of my companions. Thus relieved of a grievous load, I from that hour set to work afresh, resolved to pioneer my way through every difficulty. I toiled hard and my success was proportionate to my efforts. My memory, not naturally tenacious, improved with practice. Exercise sharpened my wits. In a few weeks I was promoted to a higher class. In less than two months I was allowed to commence French and drawing. I learned the first two tenses of the verb être, and sketched my first cottage, whose walls, by the by, outrivalled in slope those of the leaning tower of Pisa, on the same day. That night, on going to bed, I forgot to prepare in imagination the barmecide supper of hot roast potatoes, or white bread and new milk, with which I was wont to amuse my inward cravings. I feasted instead on the spectacle of ideal drawings which I saw in the dark, all the work of my own hands, freely pencilled houses and trees, picturesque rocks and ruins, kipe-like groups of cattle, sweet paintings of butterflies hovering over unblown roses, of birds picking at ripe cherries, of wrens' nests enclosing pearl-like eggs, wreathed about with young ivy sprays. I examined, too, in thought, the possibility of my ever being able to translate, currently, a certain little French story which Madame Pierrot had that day shown me, nor was that problem solved to my satisfaction ere I fell sweetly asleep. Well has Solomon said, Better is a dinner of herbs where love is, than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. I would not now have exchanged Lowood with all its privations, for Gateshead and its daily luxuries. CHAPTER Nine. But the privations, or rather the hardships of Lowood, lessened. Spring drew on. She was indeed already come. The frosts of winter had ceased, its snows were melted, its cutting winds ameliorated. My wretched feet, flayed and swollen to lameness by the sharp air of January, began to heal and subside under the gentler breathings of April. The nights and mornings no longer by their Canadian temperature froze the very blood in our veins. We could now endure the play-hour passed in the garden. Sometimes on a sunny day it began even to be pleasant and genial, and a greenness grew over those brown beds, which, freshening daily, suggested the thought that hope traversed them at night, and left each morning brighter traces of her steps. Flowers peeped out amongst the leaves, snowdrops, crocuses, purple auriculas, and golden-eyed pansies. On Thursday afternoons, half-holidays, we now took walks, and found still sweeter flowers opening by the wayside, under the hedges. 
I discovered, too, that a great pleasure, an enjoyment which the horizon only bounded, lay all outside the high and spike-guarded walls of our garden. This pleasure consisted in prospect of noble summits girdling a great hill-hollow, rich in verdure and shadow, in a bright beck, full of dark stones and sparkling eddies. How different had this scene looked when I viewed it laid out beneath the iron sky of winter, stiffened in frost, shrouded with snow! When mists as chill as death wandered to the impulse of east winds along those purple peaks, and rolled down Ing and Holm till they blended with the frozen fog of the beck. The beck itself was then a torrent, turban and curbless. It tore asunder the wood, and sent a raving sound through the air, often thickened with wild rain or whirling sleet, and for the forest on its banks, that showed only ranks of skeletons. April advanced to May. A bright, serene May it was. Days of blue sky, placid sunshine, and soft western or southern gales filled up its duration. And now vegetation matured with vigour. Low wood shook loose its tresses. It became all green, all flowery. Its great elm, ash, and oak skeletons were restored to majestic life. Woodland plants sprang up profusely in its recesses. Unnumbered varieties of moss filled its hollows, and it made a strange ground sunshine out of the wealth of its wild primrose plants. I have seen their pale gold gleam in overshadowed spots, like scatterings of the sweetest lustre. All this I enjoyed often and fully, free, unwatched, and almost alone. For this unwonted liberty and pleasure there was a cause, to which it now becomes my task to advert. Have I not described a pleasant sight for a dwelling, when I speak of it as bosomed in hill and wood, and rising from the verge of a stream? Assuredly pleasant enough, but whether healthy or not is another question. That forest dell, where low wood lay, was the cradle of fog, and fog-bred pestilence which, quickening with the quickening spring, crept into the orphan asylum, breathed typhus through its crowded schoolroom and dormitory, and ere May arrived, transformed the seminary into a hospital. Semi-starvation and neglected colds had predisposed most of the pupils to receive infection. Forty-five out of the eighty girls lay ill at one time. Classes were broken up, rules relaxed. The few who continued well were allowed almost unlimited licence, because the medical attendant insisted on the necessity of frequent exercise to keep them in health, and had it been otherwise, no one had leisure to watch or restrain them. Miss Temple's whole attention was absorbed by the patients. She lived in the sick-room, never quitting it except to snatch a few hours' rest at night. The teachers were fully occupied with packing up and making other necessary preparations, for the departure of those girls who were fortunate enough to have friends and relations, able and willing to remove them from the seat of contagion. Many, already smitten, went home only to die. Some died at the school, and were buried quietly and quickly, the nature of the malady forbidding delay. While disease had thus become an inhabitant of Lowood, and death its frequent visitor, while there was gloom and fear within its walls, while its rooms and passages steamed with hospital smells, the drug and the pastille striving vainly to overcome the effluvia of mortality, that bright May shone unclouded over the bold hills and beautiful woodland out of doors. Its garden, too, glowed with flowers. Hollyhocks had sprung up tall as trees, lilies had opened, tulips and roses were in bloom, the borders of the little beds were gay with pink thrift and crimson double daisies, the sweetbriars gave out morning and evening their scent of spice and apples, and these fragrant treasures were all useless for most of the inmates of Lowood, except to furnish now and then a handful of herbs and blossoms to put in a coffin. But I, and the rest who continued well, enjoyed fully the beauties of the scene and season. They let us ramble in the wood, like gypsies from morning till night. We did what we liked, went where we liked. We lived better, too. Mr. Brocklehurst and his family never came near Lowood now. Household matters were not scrutinised into. 
The cross housekeeper was gone, driven away by the fear of infection. Her successor, who had been matron at the Lowton dispensary, unused to the ways of her new abode, provided with comparative liberality. Besides, there were fewer to feed. The sick could eat little. Our breakfast basins were better filled. When there was no time to prepare a regular dinner, which happened often, she would give us a large piece of cold pie, or a thick slice of bread and cheese, and this we carried away with us to the wood, where we each chose the spot we liked best, and dined sumptuously. My favourite seat was a smooth and broad stone, rising white and dry from the very middle of the beck, and only to be got at by wading through the water, a feat I accomplished barefoot. The stone was just broad enough to accommodate, comfortably, another girl and me. At that time my chosen comrade, one Marianne Wilson, a shrewd, observant personage, whose society I took pleasure in, partly because she was witty and original, and partly because she had a manner which set me at my ease. Some years older than I, she knew more of the world, and could tell me many things I liked to hear. With her my curiosity found gratification. To my faults, also, she gave ample indulgence, never imposing curb or rein on anything I said. She had a turn for narrative, I for analysis. She liked to inform, I to question. So we got on swimmingly together, deriving much entertainment, if not much improvement, from our mutual intercourse. And where, meantime, was Helen Burns? Why did I not spend these sweet days of liberty with her? Had I forgotten her? Or was I so worthless as to have grown tired of her pure society? Surely the Marianne Wilson I have mentioned was inferior to my first acquaintance. She could only tell me amusing stories, and reciprocate any racy and pungent gossip I chose to indulge in. While, if I have spoken truth of Helen, she was qualified to give those who enjoyed the privilege of her converse a taste of far higher things. True, reader! And I knew and felt this. And though I am a defective being, with many faults and few redeeming points, yet I never tired of Helen Burns, nor ever ceased to cherish for her a sentiment of attachment, as strong, tender, and respectful as any that ever animated my heart. How could it be otherwise, when Helen, at all times and under all circumstances, evinced for me a quiet and faithful friendship, which ill-humour never soured, nor irritation never troubled? But Helen was ill at present. For some weeks she had been removed from my sight, to I knew not what room upstairs. She was not, I was told, in the hospital portion of the house with the fever patients, for her complaint was consumption, not typhus. And by consumption I, in my ignorance, understood something mild, which time and care would be sure to alleviate. I was confirmed in this idea by the fact of her once or twice coming downstairs on very warm sunny afternoons, and being taken by Miss Temple into the garden. But on these occasions I was not allowed to go and speak to her. I only saw her from the schoolroom window, and then not distinctly, for she was much wrapped up, and sat at a distance under the veranda. One evening, in the beginning of June, I had stayed out very late with Mary Ann in the wood. We had, as usual, separated ourselves from the others, and had wandered far, so far that we lost our way, and had to ask it at a lonely cottage, where a man and woman lived who looked after a herd of half-wild swine that fed on the mast in the wood. When we got back, it was after moonrise. A pony, which we knew to be the surgeon's, was standing at the garden door. Marianne remarked that she supposed some one must be very ill, as Mr. Bates had been sent for at that time of the evening. She went into the house. I stayed behind a few minutes to plant in my garden a handful of roots I had dug up in the forest, and which I feared would wither if I left them till the morning. This done, I lingered yet a little longer. The flowers smelt so sweet as the dew fell. It was such a pleasant evening, so serene, so warm. The still glowing west promised so fairly another fine day on the morrow. The moon rose with such majesty in the grave east. I was noting these things, and enjoying them as a child might, when it entered my mind as it had never done before. How sad to be lying now on a sick-bed, and to be in danger of dying! This world is pleasant. It would be dreary to be called from it. 
and to have to go who knows where. And then my mind made its first earnest effort to comprehend what had been infused into it concerning heaven and hell, and for the first time it recoiled, baffled, and for the first time glancing behind on each side and before it, it saw all round an unfathomed gulf. It felt the one point where it stood, the present. All the rest was formless cloud and vacant depth, and it shuddered at the thought of tottering and plunging amid that chaos. While pondering this new idea, I heard the front door open. Mr. Bates came out, and with him was a nurse. After she had seen him mount his horse and depart, she was about to close the door, but I ran up to her. "'How is Helen Burns?' "'Very poorly,' was the answer. "'Is it her Mr. Bates has been to see?' Yes. And what does he say about her? He says she'll not be here long. This phrase, uttered in my hearing yesterday, would have only conveyed the notion that she was about to be removed to Northumberland to her own home. I should not have suspected that it meant she was dying. But I knew instantly now. It opened clear on my comprehension that Helen Burns was numbering her last days in this world, and that she was going to be taken to the region of spirits, if such region there were. I experienced a shock of horror, then a strong thrill of grief, then a desire, a necessity to see her, and I asked in what room she lay. "'She is in Miss Temple's room,' said the nurse. "'May I go up and speak to her?' Oh, no, child, it is not likely. And now it is time for you to come in. You'll catch the fever if you stop out when the dew is falling." The nurse closed the front door. I went in by the side entrance which led to the schoolroom. I was just in time. It was nine o'clock, and Miss Miller was calling the pupils to go to bed. It might be two hours later, probably near eleven, when I, not having been able to fall asleep, and deeming from the perfect silence of the dormitory that my companions were all wrapped in profound repose, rose softly, put on my frock over my nightdress, and without shoes crept from the apartment, and set off in quest of Miss Temple's room. It was quite at the other end of the house, but I knew my way, and the light of the unclouded summer moon, entering here and there at passage windows, enabled me to find it without difficulty. An odour of camphor and burnt vinegar warned me when I came near the fever-room, and I passed its door quickly, fearful lest the nurse who sat up all night should hear me. I dreaded being discovered and sent back, for I must see Helen, I must embrace her before she died, I must give her one last kiss, exchange with her one last word. Having descended a staircase, traversed a portion of the house below, and succeeded in opening and shutting without noise two doors, I reached another flight of steps. These I mounted, and then just opposite to me was Miss Temple's room. A light shone through the keyhole and from under the door. A profound stillness pervaded the vicinity. Coming near, I found the door slightly ajar, probably to admit some fresh air into the close abode of sickness. Indisposed to hesitate, and full of impatient impulses, soul and senses quivering with keen throes, I put it back and looked in. My eyes sought Helen, and feared to find death. Close by Miss Temple's bed, and half covered with its white curtains, there stood a little crib. I saw the outline of a form under the clothes, but the face was hid by the hangings. The nurse I had spoken to in the garden sat in an easy-chair asleep, an unsnuffed candle burnt dimly on the table. Miss Temple was not to be seen. I knew afterwards that she had been called to a delirious patient in the fever-room. I advanced, then paused by the crib's side. My hand was on the curtain, but I preferred speaking before I withdrew it. I still recoiled at the dread of seeing a corpse. "'Helen,' I whispered softly, "'are you awake?' She stirred herself, put back the curtain, and I saw her face, pale, wasted, but quite composed. She looked so little changed that my fear was instantly dissipated. "'Can it be you, Jane?' she asked, in her own gentle voice. "'Oh,' I thought, "'she is not going to die. They are mistaken. She could not speak and look so calmly if she were.' I got under her crib and kissed her. Her forehead was cold and a cheek both cold and thin, and so were her hand and wrist. 
but she smiled as of old. "'Why are you come here, Jane? It is past eleven o'clock. I heard it strike some minutes since. I came to see you, Helen. I heard you were very ill, and I could not sleep till I had spoken to you. You came to bid me good-bye, then. You are just in time, probably. Are you going somewhere, Helen? Are you going home? Yes, to my long home, my last home. No, no, Helen! I stopped, distressed. While I tried to devour my tears, a fit of coughing seized Helen. It did not, however, wake the nurse. When it was over, she lay some minutes exhausted. Then she whispered, "'Jane, your little feet are bare. Lie down and cover yourself with my quilt.' I did so. She put her arm over me, and I nestled close to her. After a long silence, she resumed, still whispering, "'I am very happy, Jane. And when you hear that I am dead, you must be sure and not grieve. There is nothing to grieve about. We all must die one day, and the illness which is removing me is not painful. It is gentle and gradual. My mind is at rest. I leave no one to regret me much. I have only a father, and he is lately married and will not miss me. By dying young I shall escape great sufferings. I had not qualities or talents to make my way very well in the world. I should have been continually at fault. But where are you going to, Helen? Can you see? Do you know? I believe. I have faith. I am going to God. Where is God? What is God? My Maker and yours, who will never destroy what He created. I rely implicitly on His power, and confide wholly in His goodness. I count the hours till that eventful one arrives which shall restore me to Him, reveal Him to me. You are sure, then, Helen, that there is such a place as heaven, and that our souls can get to it when we die? I am sure there is a future state. I believe God is good. I can resign my immortal part to Him without any misgiving. God is my Father. God is my friend. I love him. I believe he loves me. And shall I see you again, Helen, when I die? You will come to the same region of happiness, be received by the same mighty universal parent, no doubt, dear Jane." Again I questioned, but this time only in thought. Where is that region? Does it exist? and I clasped my arms closer round Helen. She seemed dearer to me than ever. I felt as if I could not let her go. I lay with my face hidden on her neck. Presently she said, in the sweetest tone, "'How comfortable I am! The last fit of coughing has tired me a little. I feel as if I could sleep. But don't leave me, Jane. I like to have you near me.' "'I'll stay with you. Dear Helen, no one shall take me away.' Are you warm, darling? Yes. Good night, Jane. Good night, Helen. She kissed me, and I her, and we both soon slumbered. When I awoke it was day. An unusual movement roused me. I looked up. I was in somebody's arms. The nurse held me. She was carrying me through the passage back to the dormitory. I was not reprimanded for leaving my bed. People had something else to think about. No explanation was afforded then to my many questions. But a day or two afterwards I learned that Miss Temple, on returning to her own room at dawn, had found me laid in the little crib, my face against Helen Byrne's shoulder, my arms round her neck. I was asleep, and Helen was dead. Her grave is in Brocklebridge churchyard. For fifteen years after her death it was only covered by a grassy mound, but now a grey marble tablet marks the spot, inscribed with her name, and the word, Resurgam. <laughs>